Praise the Lord. Great. <clears throat> what a joy. What a joy to be here, isn't it? Wow. We're going to have a great week. Praise God. Wow. Wow. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Good choir. Okay, you want to pray with me for a moment? Let's have a prayer. Father, we pray that this fellowship this week would be deep, personal, powerful. Thank you for the words, the love, the faith, the servants. Thank you for the body of Christ, the gifts, the vision, the heart, the passion, the forgiveness, the grace. And we are here in your name. What an awesome honor to be in your name. Thank you. Encourage us, build us up, teach us, and instruct us. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, keep us from evil. Guide us, give us our daily bread. Anoint us with fresh oil, for we are called by your name. Thank you, God, in Christ's name. Amen. Would you turn to a few places, 2 Kings chapter 4, and can you hear me okay? Okay, it's, I can't hear myself too well, it seems. Okay, it sounds, doesn't sound right to me. Now it's kind of, is it sound right? Is it, is it normal? Oh, good, okay. All right. Connection, personal walk with God. Pastor Chevalier preached a great message at nine o'clock this morning on in the service at nine on a personal walk with God. This is our subject today, and I'd like you to see a few points before we go into the message. So this is Second Kings. And verse, chapter 4, and verse 8. Would you read it out loud with me? And it fell on a day that Elijah passed to Shunem, where was a great woman, and she constrained him to eat bread. And so it was that as he, off as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. And she said unto her husband, verse 9, Behold now, I perceive that this is a holy man of God, which passes by us continually. Why, well, isn't that interesting? Like, she saw that this is a man of God. How did she know that? What does it mean when you see a man of God or a woman of God? And you may be a great person, the word great here, a powerful, important, influential woman. And she was able to see that this man, Elijah, was a man of God. This is important. Because you are born again, you have now discernment. Because you are born again, you have the Spirit of God. And you're able to recognize other people walk by but, but some discern and recognize that this is a man of God. That's what has happened to us. We found a man of God. We found the message. We found the leading of God. God found us. God led us. God put us somewhere. And we saw a man of God is walking by, and she said to her husband, Now, why didn't he say it? Where was he? With a remote somewhere? <laughs> what was going on with him? 
Why didn't he say it? Oh, I, to a honey dear, I perceive this is a, she said it to him, all right? All the men sit down, the women stay standing. <laughs> Go ahead, I'm serious, the men sit down. Shame on you men. Shame on you, ladies, just turn to him and look at him. Shame on you men. You should know better, all right, you may all be seated. <clears throat> we read in the story that because she received this man into her home and she fed him with her husband, they mutually agreed that she didn't know it but this event was going to precipitate something greater and bigger because she didn't have any children. Also, her husband was old. That's in verse 14. He said, then, what then is to be done for her? And Gehazi said, she has no child and her husband is old. Oh, he's the oldest thing you've ever seen. That old guy and his family. But if you are connected, and you are connected with the right person, the right people, you are connected in faith with Jesus Christ. If you are connected, you have a future. You have a life that you couldn't have otherwise. When you are connected with God, the living God, that you have something going on in your life, and it may seem very small. You might even think it is of little consequence. It doesn't matter so much. But actually, it's the only thing that matters, who I am connected with. There are two aspects here, and we'll look at it in a minute, but I want to park here for emphasis. It says here in verse 10, let's make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the, on the wall, and let us set for him there a bed and a table and a stool and a candlestick. It shall be when he comes to us that he will turn in thither. She made it hospitable, appropriate. There was a place there. I think about this regarding our church life. There are people that drive by this church and now they realize it's a church because we have our entryway. Before they thought it was a clothes factory. They drive by, why are all the cars there? They drive by, what is going on there? I wonder what they think. Many things. There's something I want you to notice about our culture. In the USA, in any culture, this is Romans and chapter one. We have verse 18 all the way to verse 32. There's three things that happen. First, people suppress the truth. They hold it down. They, they don't pay attention to it. When the moon and the stars and the ocean and the woods and the animals and the insects speak of God, they say there is no God, or I don't want to know about him. One time evangelizing, I said to a man, I, I said, do you want to know God? He said, yes. I said, if God was in that other room behind that wall, God was there, and he's asking you to come in to turn the corner, would you go? He started to get a little bit of, think about it, a little nervous. His palms were sweaty. 
clammy. He said, no. I understand that answer. If God was there, do you want to meet him? Maybe not. If God is there, do I want to be accountable to him? I don't think so. That's the nature of man. He suppresses the truth. The result is a heresy. Ravi Zacharias mentioned this in a message recently. That the first thing that happens in the United States of America and that happens in the human heart wherever you are is heresy. Heresy means a separation from truth. Heresy is all over. It's the nature of our culture. It starts with denying God. I'm not seeking him. I don't care about him. I'm not interested. Or I might say I am, but there's no real message of truth that challenges me in the flesh. Oh, yes, there are churches that have saved God. And they will say universalism. Unitarianism, we're all brothers and sisters worldwide. You can get to heaven many ways. One man said to me that to me recently, and I said, Well, why would God send his only son to suffer and die and bleed on a cross if another leader, another man, another religion would be enough? And he said, That's a good point. And I agree. It's a biblical point. But because you suppress, we, the nature of our culture, our, our country, our history, is suppressing, and it leads to, the heresy leads to idolatry. I have other gods, gods of this world, the gods of me, gods of my interests, my life, my happiness. We spoke of it recently that it is the good life. In the back of a Jeep, you have the tire cover and it says life is good. And I think there is a measure of godliness in that statement, for God has filled the earth with his goodness. But if this is my purpose, to know, possess, protect, to govern, to have, to take, acquire, to be important, to be a very important, to be valuable, if this is my life, then your gods, our gods, are too small. And in America, this is the problem. Our gods are too small. And we'll look at that in a moment. Powerful thought. Our gods are too small, but it's not over. It's a threefold de uh, moving away into more and more trouble. And this is the third part, witchcraft. Idolatry leads to witchcraft. You might say, is that in the States? Yes, it's moving not necessarily the point it had in the broomstick, but it's spiritual power of darkness with neckties and suits on. It's power. It's counsel on the television. It's misleading. It's finding the power within. It's knowing yourself, as we would say, in life, finding my value and my importance based upon uh, the spirit of the age. And what is being cranked up globally is the whole idea of mankind living without God, the God we know, the one that is narrow, the way is narrow, the God of truth, the God of doctrine, the God of the Holy Spirit. For we have all lived without the Holy Spirit. We've all lived with love, but not God's love. We've said recently, there's a lot of love in this world. There's a lot of love. You hear it all the time. I love my dog. I love my girlfriend. 
love my family, love my country, love my friend. There's a lot of love, but uh, where does it go? How long does it last? How satisfying is it? Satisfying. How, how good is your God of love? This is a small g God. The God of falling in love with every other girl you meet. Falling in love with another one and another one. Falling in love with a person or a project or an idea. We are a very dangerous people. It's a downhill slide from heresy, no truth, to my own ideas, into spiritual darkness and power in that darkness. Notice something now. Go to Job with me, please, in chapter 1. So good to have Pastor Carl here and Susie. Great to have Petri Kostelin in. Amazing. Wow. Great to have, there's so many people here from different places. It stirs us. Great servants of God that have gathered here. We are so honored to have this fellowship that is of this nature because our God is not like their God. And I want you to see this with me. This is powerful. Job chapter 1. The devil is speaking. Verse 9. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for nothing? We need to park there because that's a difficult sentence to digest. Let's we'll say it together. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for nothing? S Satan was at one time called Lucifer. He was an angel. And I have a big question in my heart about him. We'll just draw him like this, put wings on him. And here's God, okay? My big question is, did he know God? That's a big question in my mind. Was he the most beautiful? He was most beautiful of all of God's creatures. And how about wisdom? He was the most wise. Two things that people would love to have, beauty and wisdom. Two things that Eve was attracted to in the garden. She saw the tree was beautiful, good for food, and it would make somebody wise. These two things are very much desired by all of us as people made in God's image. And Lucifer had those two things. But there's a deeper question. Did he know God? We have to say, of course, he was in heaven. He was made an angel. He was at the throne. He heard God, saw God, knew God. Yes, but there's a deeper question, actually. And it is, did he really know him? He knew he was powerful, but that's not the same. Because we know, as people... That I could sit across the table from a person I've known for 20 years. But still the question is, do I know them? Isn't that correct? Why do we say this? Because he fell. Why did he fall? Why didn't he trust God? Why didn't he know who God was? Who is the person that did know God? We have God, and who's the one that we know knew him? The Son of God. And who was Jesus? We can put here, was he beautiful? 
Isaiah 53 says he wasn't so great to look at. Was he wise? The Bible says the wisdom of God is the foolishness to men. He actually was considered, in a sense, to be foolish. But if you took the Son of God and you, you take away his beauty and you take away his wisdom... And of course, in a sense, you can't. I mean, he is who he is. But as a man, he was greatly humbled, greatly humiliated. He was brought very low. But what kept him? He knew the Father. I know my Father. If I suffer, I know my Father. If he takes away everything from me, I know my father. If I am in a lot of trouble, I know my father. If I'm hanging on a cross, I know my father. Is this the difference between Lucifer and Christ? And is it the point when Lucifer fell, became Satan here, He's telling other human beings basically the same thing. You can't trust God. He is not for you. Job only fears you, God, because if you take away his stuff, he'll curse you like I did. Because he can't handle that. You take away his stuff... Uh, that because that's who you are. I know who you are. And God would answer to answer Lucifer, Satan, you don't know who I am. Wow. Read it with me. Verse 10. Here it comes. Here it comes the big part. Have you not made a hedge about him? Verse 10. Have you not put a hedge about Job and about his house and about all that he has on every side? We have, um, for, for the sake of, of memory, uh, I've chosen these words. we we'll start with a P. You protect him. Protection. God, you protect Job. And if you stop protecting him, then he'll curse you. And God said, okay. That's how the story goes. Next part. Thou hast blessed the work of his hands. This is production. Take away my productivity. What I'm living for, my success, my my production, how I can live week by week, month by month, year by year, take away my sense of, of accomplishment, and I will wonder who God is. Why would he do that to me? And his substance increased in the land. We have possession And then, fourth one, prophet. <clears throat> God, you take away these things. I can't help but put myself in that picture. God, you protect me. I know you do. You're my tower, my hiding place. And if you take that away from me, I wonder, I wonder who you are. Aren't you my protector? And in the life of Christ, he was always protected until a certain hour. And in that hour, he knew it was over. The protection would be gone and he'd be crucified by the hands of evil men, a lamb to the slaughter. Believers, we believers, of course, we don't like to think 
that God would take away his protection. But if he did, do I know him? You might say, what does that mean? Something I hope becomes clear to us by the end of the message. That to know him, to actually sense him, for the Holy Spirit to be our portion. Though he slay me, yet I will trust him. This is what Job said. Job 13, is it verse, help me, 15 is it? Though he slay me, yet I will protect trust him. Production. I'm sitting as a missionary in some foreign field. I'm sitting somewhere and I'm wondering what is all my sowing and all the watering and all the investment. I'm looking for the production. Possession. My possessions are taken away and then profit. Job was really struggling as he saw this happen and his life in a sense it just just deteriorated it was gone little by little actually dramatically radically and he found himself in the dust and in the ashes When this happened to Jesus Christ, we saw in Jesus, he said I, in, in John chapter 16, 31, that my father, I will be left alone, but I will not be alone because my father is with me. This is how much he knew and he understood. When God tested Abraham in Genesis 22, he said, take your son, your only son, to a place where I will show you. And it says that God tempted Abraham. It means he tested him. He tested the heart of Abraham. I remember a story from World War II days about a soldier in Europe who was writing love letters with a woman he had never seen. The woman was writing him and, and they wanted to meet finally at a train station here in the United States somewhere. And he had never seen her and they, they realized by their letter writing that they had a lot in common and so on. And she said, you, you've never seen me, but you will recognize me by the rose in my lapel at the train station. You're, the train will be arriving at this hour. I will be waiting for you, and I'll have a rose in my lapel. And the woman um, went there. The man came. And what the beautiful woman did, who had a green dress on in the story, I remember that part, and she had taken the, the red rose and given it to another woman and said, would you wear this for me? And this woman was not attractive, not, not, not the kind of woman that... And when he came off the train, he walked past the beautiful woman with the green dress. And their eyes made eye contact. And he went up to the woman with the red rose in her lapel and said, I am so-and-so. And she said, I am sorry, I don't know you, who you are, but that woman asked me to wear this red, red rose in my lapel. I like the story because it reminds me of what happens to us in this life. God is testing our hearts. And we have a new heart. And we have doctrine in our heart. And we can walk past the beautiful and do the right thing and find God and God's blessing. We can walk past the gods of this world 
and say, I am the God of success. I am the God of beauty. I am the God of long life. I am the God of happiness. And we answer in our hearts, where is the God of doctrine, the God of love, the God of truth that I will honestly be drawn to? Not suppress, not lie, not cheat, but I will be drawn personally to this God, the living God, the one that hides in darkness, the one that looks a bit ugly, but he is the way, the truth, and the, the one not with the glitz and the, the, the Las Vegas jazz, but the dumpy one with the rose in the lapel that's there with another message for me that I know actually I am the one that is testing your heart. Give me your son. I'm not going to give you my son. And if you talk to Lucifer that way, Lucifer, give me your beauty. What? I am giving you my beauty? You gave this to me. God is saying, do you know me, Lucifer? Do you really know me? Unfortunately, this is the, the irony of life, that the people that are looking for God, they cannot find him because they're wanting to meet him on their own terms for their sake for their glory, their honor, their way, their beauty, their, their uh, popularity. We were talking recently how much God loves common people. You know, in the work of the ministry, the people that I see that are used most are the common people. The common people who don't have anything except simply that they, with all their heart, they will trust in him. The common people that will go to this book and say, Jesus, I, with all my heart, I would like to know you. And Jesus said, I, I, with all my heart, I came for you. I love you. You cannot imagine what I have for you at my right hand. And you say, yes, Lord, I know later in eternity, later in heaven, that'll be the way it is. And Jesus is saying, oh, no, you do not understand. What I have right now is so deeply satisfying for you, better than any God you would ever find anywhere in this world, better than the best life you could ever imagine. What you really are looking for is me walking with me. In the book of Job, we cringe reading it. Lucifer, is, Satan, is like strutting around. I know this guy. He's nothing. This guy's like a nickel. He's a two-bit human being. I know what's in his heart. You, he, you just touch his stuff. These words here. You don't protect him. There's no productivity. There's no possessions. And there's no profit. And he'll curse you. Because he doesn't, because that's just how it is. And God is saying, oh no, I know who Job is. I know, he's going to, it'll be hard, it'll be tough, it'll be tough. Oh yeah, it'll be tough, he'll stumble along. But at the end of the story, you're going to find out that he is much better than you, Lucifer. Much better than you, Satan. At the end of the story, you're going to find somebody that is crowned from the dust. I make a man greater than you. From the dust, I, met, I show my wisdom and my glory. I show my reality through a man made out of the dust of the ground. You were not made out of dust. You're an angel. Like poof, you know, like I made you as spiritual material. And this dirt is a lot inferior to an angel, but not for long. We are made a little lower than the angels for a season, but we are crowned with glory and honor. And we are above the angels because God became a man so that man might be in God. <clears throat> K. 
connection. Okay, closing part. This woman who sees the man of God walking by and he stops in at times, she says, I know this is a man of God. That's a great story. Just a, just a simple little occasion, event in Mexico, a Peru, a small encounter somewhere in Puerto Rico or um, in uh, Bangalore, India, or in the Himalayan mountains. A small, commonplace, simple, very simple. But you and I, and I, this is an incredible reality, you and I are connected to God. You say, Pastor, I don't know about me. And we say, yes, you need to learn how, about, you need to learn the doctrine that tells you who you are. Of course, you beat up yourself. Of course, we get down on ourselves. Of course, we don't think so highly of ourselves. Of course, we're naturally minded. Of course, we are judgmental. Of course, we condemn ourselves and we condemn others. Listen, when you know God, you stop three things you stop doing. Write this down. This is number one. You stop blaming people. You do. You stop. Even if they're guilty, you don't blame them. You don't blame them. I remember being on the mission field. We had this meeting somewhere, and one guy in charge of the key for the room, he didn't bring it. He forgot it, and he did it more than once. <laughs> he forgot the room. I, I don't accuse him. I'm not blaming him. Why? Because we are like God. We are like God. Isn't that exciting? We learned it in our church. You don't blame people, even when they're guilty. What? Hunt, you know, I'm, I'm dead on the side of the road on 95 without gas. Who do I blame? My wife. <laughs> Lisa, why didn't you put gas in the car? What does she answer? Why didn't you put gas in the car? No, she didn't. Because <laughs> she doesn't blame either. We don't blame. You go with it. You learn God. You walk with God. God is in it. Do you see that? This is powerful. Wow. I don't blame on the mission field. I remember I was in Finland. First three months, four months was amazing. I loved it. It was everything about the country was excellent. I couldn't believe what a beautiful place it was, how much I loved the people and I enjoyed being there. And then it changed. It's too clean around here. I feel like taking a garbage can and just throwing it on the street. There's no broken windows. We need to break a window. There's not enough mistakes. It's too perfect or clean or whatever. Where's the problem? Hello? Me. I need to walk with God. Do you think Finland cares about me being in Finland? They don't need me, and I don't need to become another fin I don't need a fin. They make fins there. <laughs> they make fins. You know, one fin with another female fin, male and female. Remember that idea? <laughs> male and female, and they make fins. What did they need in Finland? They needed a man of God. They needed a man, men of God, women of God. They needed Elijah passing by. And they say, come on in. We're making a room for you. You are here. You are welcome. We are connected. Satan is unconnected. Satan is shooting, trying. He doesn't even know what will happen with Job. He's guessing, he's accusing, he's blaming. Of course he is. And he, he's taking a gamble. Ah, he's putting his cards. Ah, I know, God, you just take away from him his stuff. He'll curse you. And we could say, 
Satan, are you sure? Do you know? And he doesn't know. He doesn't know the heart, the grace, the mind, the ways of God. He doesn't know. We ourselves are surprised at ourselves. When we walk with God, we ourselves are amazed. We ourselves are amazed that God is so real, personal, and caring. That we are energized, enthusiastic, and internally motivated. We ourselves are excited. This is whatever year. we got to figure out the years. I think we started these conventions in 76. You do the math. Okay, we're all slow. <laughs> we have been doing these, and this one is just as fresh, as exciting, as important as any of them. Because we are not connected with some dead, impotent, false, empty, witchcraft, power, idolatrous, heresy, with a human heart in charge. We are touched. Second and third thing, you don't blame people. And then, secondly, you don't judge people. Pastor Love gave a great message recently about judging. There was a, I don't know, it was the Boston Red Sox, and they were playing in a World Series, and I'm confusing teams, I'm sure, and I wish uh, I had the detail, but the principle is this. The manager of the team, they, he was doing the best he could, but behind the game in his personal life, he, his son had cancer. I think a 12-year-old son was dying. And he's managing the boss and Red Sox. He's managing the team. And, but he, in a sense, the game was not as important to him as his son's life, what he was suffering, what he was going through. You cannot judge people. You don't know what they're going through. You don't know what depression is until you've had one. You don't know what it is to be a loser until you've been there. You don't know what is happening out there in the life of a person, brokenhearted, destitute, devastated, wounded, and hurt. You cannot judge people. Number one, blame them. Two, judge them. And number three, it's, very, it's a very important one with regards to a spirit-filled believer that is knowing God in a personal way. I am not complaining. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. You can't complain. You have to walk with God. God put me here. When I'm, I'm going to make something. I remember the story about the mouse that fell in a bucket of milk. And the mouse was going to drown in the milk, but he just kept paddling and paddling and paddling, and he turned it into butter. And then he just walked out. I can't complain. I got to get busy with my calling and my work. I got to get busy with where God wants me to be. And at the end of the day, we will say, we will know in our heart, we know him. What could be greater than that you know him? There are some guys, they get devastated when their girlfriend uh, doesn't like them, or they get that men and women problems that we have, we are devastated when these things are touched. But God is saying to Satan, go ahead, take him. But I, I, I want to fill in what I think God was knowing, of course, because he knows everything. I know where this is going. I know. And, you know, in your church life, this is your home. This is where we are connected. This is where we have the knowledge of God in our heart. There is a suffering, a loss. We lose our lives when we do this. We lose our self-life, our self-interest life. We lose our, 
our rights to complain. We lose our rights to ourselves. We lose our rights to defend. We lose our rights to be like strong and wise and clever and successful. Look at Christ, the most successful man in human history, but he did it an entirely different way. He knew his father, and he walked with him, and he honored him. At times he's very quiet, at times he's detached, at times he knows what is a very important thing. And when he enters into it, he has something to give, not to tear down. And he loved the common people because he knew that common people would be longing for and hungry for a message of grace and the knowledge of him. Take a man or a woman, anyone, and give them the knowledge of God. And they are powerful people. They make friends. They create a world of joy. They, they bring Christ into darkness. They, they have an answer. Suddenly, out of, in their mind, suddenly they realize, ah, this is what we need to do. Uh, suddenly in their mind, like Joseph in prison, he would say, ah, ah. I know what the dream means. Well, how do you know that, Joe? God showed it to me. I live with God. God showed me. Suddenly, like Daniel became the greatest in Persia. How, Daniel? Now, I want you to know, Nebuchadnezzar, that nobody could answer your question or tell you your dream. Nobody could interpret it. But I know God. God will show me the dream. I know who God is. That's what your life is. And you, if you doubt it, I'm here to tell you, don't doubt it. I'm here to encourage you in it. And take notice, the guy walking past your, bet your dining room kitchen window is a guy that you should invite into your house. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, Oliver, yeah. And, and to say it in application, there's a message here at 6025 Moravia Park Drive. There's a body life that's here all week long. There's a, a fellowship of Christ in the homes and the families of the people that are listening to the truth, even if it hurts me. Just reverse what's going on in America. Instead of heresy, they go to truth, doctrine. They get it. Instead of idolatry, what happened when they took the Ark of the Covenant and they put it in the house of Obadiah? It said, God bless the house of Obadiah. He blessed me. Did he give me a new Cadillac? No, but I'll tell you one thing. When I sit down on my back patio, God speaks to my heart. It's a lot better than any Cadillac. He might give me that, but I don't care. I mean, he might give me that. That's fine. But I'm not here to talk about getting Cadillacs. I'm talking about getting blessed. God's Holy Spirit blessing and knowing God in a personal way. And then instead of witchcraft, you can have it. All the damnable activity and teaching and doctrines and ideas and shows and the whole thing on TV and the flooding of our media with all the garbage. I expect something better, better from you than to feed in the garbage can. I expect you to be feasting at the table of God and to have encouragement deep inside and say, I can do that. I can go there. I believe God. I could do that. That's possible. In my flesh, I, I wouldn't even be nearby. But in the Spirit, we're drawn close. <laughs> yeah, wow. Isn't it true? Man, wouldn't it be amazing if, if all the time we're feeding and the Spirit is showing and we are understanding and, and saying it is so. Man, we don't, right out here on the sidewalk, we don't serve any alcohol. But why is there so much joy? Right out here in the parking lot, we are not selling drugs. But why is there so much transcendency? How much so much edification? Why is it that the Bible is like talking to our hearts? 
And why do we love to see each other's faces and be edified because we haven't seen each other for a while and we are refreshed like we saw each other yesterday because we're living with the same God that is, that is our God, our God. Isn't that beautiful? That's amazing. And you know what, la, la, another thing. <laughs> a church of Christ is the only answer for our country. And I I'm, I'm have a lot of hope for our people. I have a lot of hope for missions. I have a lot of hope for Bible schools and healthy doctrinal churches. I, I do. I think there's a lot of people that are just fed up right up to here with all the garbage that is thrown at us. But we don't care so much about it because we have found the way, the truth, and the life. And by the way, every age has been a wicked one, and every nation is a wicked one. It's run by Gentiles that are unbelievers generally. It is a dark age and a dark time, and we know the preparation of global power and totalitarianism is inevitable, and there will be an Antichrist on top of the whole pile. And, uh, but we are simply ambivalent indifferent, knowing that. That is how it is, but our hearts are focused on Him who dwells in us and burns with the Spirit of fire and says to us, it is not in vain for you to hear what I have to say. It is not in vain for you to walk past that beautiful one and do the right thing and say to, in an honorable way to this woman, you know, I am the man that I've been writing to you. And she said, oh, no, I don't know who you are. But that beauty over there gave me this rose. And we say, yeah, that's what's happened to me. I have found Christ beyond the cross as the most beautiful, the most wise, the most personal, the most touching. There's no bar room in this world that could buy me that I know of in my, my wickedness, yes. There's no compromise. And there's no church, really. Thank God for all the churches. But I love this one. I love this doctrine. I love this teaching. I love this purpose. I love this mission. Because I feel that Christ is at the center of it. And he's the reason for it and the motivation in it. And if you're a little bit hurting, you're a little bit troubled, and say, oh, pastor, I got all this stuff ripped away from me just the other day. And this is encouraging to you. Keep on, great soldier of the cross. Endure hardness. Suffer well. Your God is with you. He is bigger than all the stuff in this world. Move on in your faith. God is with you, and we are with you, and we love you, and respect you, and appreciate the truth that is in us. Thank you, Lord. And Satan, you can take a height. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's finish with this one. There's a, I always say that, you know. Finishing, okay. Satan, come on, come on a little close. I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you. Look at all these people. Look at who Christ is. You can just take a long walk off a short pier. You can take a hike. We're not interested in you. You are not a challenge to us. We are set our eyes on another. Greater than you. Greater than your selling, your wares, your mentality, your cheap, empty lies, your hypocrisy. We have found reality, and we are rejoicing in it. This is our party of the year, our celebration time, our convention season, where we look at each other in the reality of Christ and say, Hallelujah, God is, and we are with him connected. Amen. Would you pray with me? Thanks you, Lord, for it, the word. Amen. And Oliver. And all the amen Charlies out there. So all the amen Charlies. Come on. Amen. 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 Oliver, amen. Love this guy. Man, he's, I mean, that's real right there, isn't it? 
Whoa, he can't, he's trying to control himself. <laughs> Just jump right out of his skin, man. All right, let's pray. If you're here this morning or you're listening on the internet, we are saying to you kindly, lovingly, persuasively, you don't have what, what it takes. You don't have it. Nobody does. But God so loved us that he gave us his son. What must I do then? Trust him. Believe in him. That's all. Say by faith, I trust you, Jesus. It's like jumping off a cliff. I'm afraid. I'm scared. I don't know what it'll do to me. I don't know what it means. And that's the, that's the faith that we're talking about. He's taking you in his arms. He's hanging on the cross. He's saying, I am gentle. I am love. I am the answer for your life. I am God, I am powerful God, but I am such a gentle God and a servant God. Come to me as you are. Say, Jesus Christ, I trust you. Please raise your hand here in the auditorium. If you're saying the prayer for the ushers to give you a booklet, anyone at all. Raise your hand, anybody. Anyone. Tonight, I, we, we'll have a beautiful service tonight. And you know what I'm thinking? That'll come this week sometime, a Romans 6 message. And it's about how you have victory over sin in your life. Let me say that again. People have sin in their life that very much hurts us, destroy, discourages us. We have sin in our life. If you have, or if we have, if I have, it's very discouraging. It tears us down. We feel very guilty about it, and it's devastating. And I want to teach about it this week. So I, it'll be amazing. Sometimes it comes across so clear, and you're so liberated by understanding who you are in Christ, and you're free from your sin and the effect of the sin through Christ Jesus. It's a great and very important message, and that'll be coming. So I want to just say that to encourage you to hear. Hear all week long. Uh, carry it with you. You're going to have a great week by God's grace. He's, gonna, he's here, and, and things are going to be just all about him. Thank you, Lord. Amen.